Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the 2019 Design Residency Final Presentation. I'm very excited to have everyone here with us this morning. Um, as you're all very aware, there's a fire in the building, possibly. Um, we're not sure where it is. If it's a real fire, if it's actually in this room, or if it's somewhere else. Um, so just be aware, we're going to keep going just to keep things moving along. This is part of the reality of the building that we're in um, and just our life. So if there are any interruptions, if there are any interruptions with, the, um, with the alarm, just, just roll with it. And I guess I'm speaking mostly to the residents. Sincerely apologize for the inconvenience, but it's just the reality. <laughs> Yeah, unless you pull the fire alarm to try and get out of this and don't do that. Um, okay, so I'm just going to make a couple of uh, 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 brief statements to get us going here. Um, the way that we wanted to start is just by acknowledging um, the ancestral lands of the indigenous peoples um, that we're on. Um, so I have, a, I have a bit of a statement here that I'm just going to read, if you'll excuse me. We acknowledge that we're on the traditional territories of many First Nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and that this land continues to be home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. The land we're on this morning in this building is covered under Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. The land of Dentonia Golf Course, the site of this year's design residency, um, is also covered under Treaty 13, as well as the Williams Treaty that was signed with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. Um, we make this statement, and I'm making this statement on behalf of the organizing committee, because we want to acknowledge uh, the ancestral lands of these peoples uh, in a spirit of reconciliation. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Doug McConnell, um, who uh, is a principal with Dialogue recently um, retired, um, but we're still involving him in many, many activities, including the design residency. So Doug's going to tell us a little bit about um, what we're doing here today. Thanks. Um, am I? Uh, yes, there we go. Uh, welcome to our other studios that are tuned in, and thanks to our panelists and everybody who's come this morning. Um, Dialogue set up the design residency to honor Tom Sutherland, our, our very fond memories of, uh, of a remarkable leader that was part of Dialogue. What uh, Tom helped us do was build what we call Dialogue, helped us define our, our culture, our character, and our, and our values. He called that developing our why. So as part of that, our anchor value is about meaningfully improving the communities that we are part of. And as part of that, investing in, in our future, thinking forward from the basis of our communities and with the future of our practice. And so um, when, we, when we chose to honor Tom's memory, we thought that building a residency like this one uh, was a remarkable opportunity. We worked with some people from a, a friendly firm of ours uh, who, uh, who uh, are here today um, to, to, uh, to set up and establish a residency that would bring together students from um, across Canada, students from a variety of disciplines, and students who are studying in a wide variety of schools. Last year's residency was in Edmonton. Last year, we looked at the opportunity that urban laneways offer our communities and what one might do with that opportunity. Um, next year, we're going to be in Vancouver, working on a problem yet to be defined. So with that, I'm going to pass it on and let's uh, be part of the residency. Great. Thanks, Doug. Um, so I'm sure you're all wondering uh, what it is that the students have been working on, um, if you're not already aware. So just to take you through it a little bit, the challenge that we task the students with this year um, is to consider how um, Dentonia Park Golf Course can be repurposed to provide a broader range of recreational opportunities and address pressing needs in the world related to housing affordability, 
newcomer and refugee settlement, community well-being, and climate change resilience. And I'll break this down a little bit for you. Um, the reason that we settled upon this topic was partly because um, municipal uh, golf courses in Toronto are um, struggling with their financial sustainability. This is um, a topic that the city itself is studying. So we considered that um, Deconia, which is itself a municipally owned golf course, um, could present a, a, an opportunity to look at um, different um, opportunities for redevelopment. This is also a, a problem that's facing communities across North America, where there's generally an oversupply of golf courses, be they municipally owned or privately owned. So the rest of the challenge, the sort of save the world part, um, was to outline and contextualize a number of different issues that um, we consider to be key for the city of Toronto um, today. You know, that includes making sure that people have equitable access to recreational opportunities and that um, those actually align with the values and, and, and the types of things that they're looking for to better their lives. Also to address um, our housing affordability crisis and, um, you know, a, a constant um, stream and, and pressure of newcomer and refugee settlement, um, as well as uh, addressing climate change resiliency. So this is the site, this is D'Antonia Park Golf Course. Um, for anyone who's aware um, or familiar with this area of the city, and I know a number of you want to just orient you, um, this is Danforth Avenue, sort of toward the um, uh, bottom of the screen, which is south. Um, D'Antonia is in the middle of the, of the screen, um, and it's bordered on either side by Victoria Park Avenue and, and Pharmacy Avenue. So this is roughly the area of Toronto referred to as Scarborough. Um, with that, I just wanted to briefly acknowledge that we've got um, a number of excellent panelists here to receive the student's presentation um, and, and provide some comment. Um, first, I wanted to introduce Mike Bell from RDG. Um, he's a landscape architect and principal with the firm. And we're really happy to have Mike with us here today because he was part of the team at RDG that originally created a residency, which our program is modeled after. Thanks, Mike. Welcome to uh, Dialogue. Excuse me while I juggle a couple things. Um, we also have joining us very shortly, though he's not here yet, um, Councillor Brad Bradford. Um, Councillor Bradford was elected in 2018 to represent Ward 19 in the City of Toronto. Um, his ward shares a boundary with the site. We're very proud to say that he's an alumnus of Dialogue um, and the Toronto Studio, in fact. And prior to uh, making the switch to politics, he worked with the Chief Planner's Office. We're also joined by Daniel Brent. Um, Daniel is a planner with the TRCA, Toronto Region Conservation Authority. Uh, since 2012. He's a member of both the Canadian Institute of Planners and OPPI. Um, he holds a number of degrees, including most recently a master's in environmental management from the university. That's great. So we're to the other studios, we're not going to burn down. We'll, we'll, we'll survive. Um, we also are joined by Emilia Floro. Um, Emilia is a program manager of urban design at the City of Toronto. Um, her work uh, includes contributing to the development of policy for waterfront revitalization, reurbanization of urban growth centers, avenue studies, and a number of other policy and design exercises. Uh, we're also joined by Brad Stevens, um, also from the TRCA. Brad is a planning ecologist um, with the TRCA, where he's been for the past 13 years. Um, through ecological technical input and review, he's played a role in uh, the development of infrastructure projects at all scales and complexities, um, including the development and approval of large policy documents um, and of projects of a variety of shapes and sizes. Um, we're also joined by Brendan Stewart. 
Brendan is an assistant professor of landscape architecture at the University of Guelph. Uh, he joined the faculty in 2017 after more than a decade of uh, practice in Toronto. His research and creative practice is focused on several projects, one of which we're particularly excited about because it closely relates to what we're doing here, um, is called Planning for Golf's Decline, which aims to generate proactive planning and design strategies to guide the future adaptation of golf courses to other uses. So Brendan was actually, um, along with Eric, who I'll introduce in a moment, um, a uh, guest speaker that we had come in on Tuesday and speak to the students and help contextualize this issue. Um, also introducing uh, Christian Van Tresca. Christian has been a planner with the City of Toronto since 2005, after a brief stint in the private sector, and he's been manager of community planning in the Scarborough District since uh, July 2018. So this, uh, this site is actually right in his, um, in his uh, area of uh, oversight. He has worked in uh, three of the city's four community planning districts, where his work is focused on urbanism in the inner suburbs, ranging from mid-rise infill on transit corridors to towers at Young and Eglinton, to planning for the revitalization of the Lawrence Heights neighborhood. Um, and last but certainly not least, um, we have Eric Davies, um, who is a uh, PhD student at the University of Toronto in the forestry department. Um, Eric was also one of the guest speakers that we had in on Tuesday um, and spoke to the students about the opportunities for rewilding and ecological regeneration on the site. So welcome, Eric. Welcome to all of our panelists. Okay. So with that, I'm gonna um, turn it over to the students now to introduce themselves. And I think we'll just navigate the microphone through the crowd. Hi, my name is Nelson Shen. I'm from the Institute of Health Policy Management Evaluation at University of Toronto. Hi, my name is Liam Murphy. I'm studying urban planning and uh, urban design at McGill University, and I'm from Calgary, Alberta. Hi, my name is Ashley Roscoe, and I'm taking a master's in community engagement at the U of A, University of Alberta. Hi, my name is Shaban. I'm studying a master's in architecture at the University of Waterloo School of Architecture. Hi, my name is Dai Pham. Uh, I'm finishing my master's degree in architecture at University of Calgary, and I'm from Vietnam. Hello, my name is Alix Tyre, and I'm studying landscape architecture at the University of British Columbia. Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Ionetta, and I'm studying civil engineering at the University of Waterloo. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Kevin Todd, and I'm studying landscape architecture at the University of Guelph. And the last one. Hi everyone, my name is Charlotte Leck, and I'm finishing my master's at Laurentian University in architecture. Thanks everyone, and uh, welcome of course to the residency. So I'm gonna turn it over to Craig Applegath, um, a co-conspirator in this, and one of several members of the organizing committee to talk a little bit about what the students did this week. Thanks, Michael. What a great introduction and, and welcome panelists and residents. Uh, what I'm, hmm. here we go. What I'm gonna do is for the people that haven't been closely following what we've done this week is give a really high level quick summary of what these students did. But before I do that, I'm looking over here and they're all bright eyed and bushy tailed. And I don't know how late you guys stayed up last night, but when I, when I came back at, at 10 from dinner with, with Doug and Mike, they were still working. Um, and I realized we had a really hard problem. We had given them the world's hardest problems. We told them about the local problem of a housing crisis in Toronto, fix that. And then we said there's an ecological crisis in the ravines with about fix that. And then we said, there's climate change happening. Um, and you have to sort of figure out what to do with that when it really hits hard. And by the way, there's gonna be 250 million climate refugees by the mid-century, do something. And you have a lot of time, two days, go. So 
what, what is amazing is that they're still smiling and talking to us. Um, they haven't left. And we saw their presentation, uh, the pre-presentation, and it's just great. I, I'm, we're very, very proud of what you've done. I hope that doesn't sound patronizing, but it's just like, wow, you guys are amazing. So let's just tell everyone what you did, um, because it's probably a blur to you. Setting the stage, first day, they arrive, there's a reception, they get sort of a bit of food, and then it's right into some lectures from various people like Brad Bradford, who I hope can make it, he is, by the way, a, a dialogue alum. He started as a planner here, then went to the city of Toronto as a planner, and then ran for council and got one of the 25 seats. Awesome. Um, Eric Davies spoke, and, and Brandon Stewart, and I didn't have a photo to put in of you. Um, and it was great because the very, very first day, they got a sense of what the challenges they faced were. And then we went to the site. And it was a glorious day. It was quite sunny, very cold, and very slippery. We walked uh, across the site to give them a sense of the real physical um, contours of the site. Um, and if that wasn't enough, they were starting to get to know one another. The first time they ever met, and then they went to Second City to do improv and team building. And I noticed, because I, I wasn't there, um, I noticed that the difference between before and after was remarkable because when I saw them again, it was at dinner and everyone was talking and connecting like they'd known each other for 10 years. The next morning, in order to get them really going with some ideas, we did a world cafe. And that's where you explore two or three questions quickly, 15-minute um, goes, post the ideas, and it would give them a sense of some of the opportunities that they could explore in the next couple of days. And then we let them go and work, but that wasn't enough. They, at the end of the, the day, Wednesday, the second day, they did a pinup. And at the end of the Thursday, yesterday, they did a pinup and we gave them feedback. And on Wednesday, it was a little more like, what about this, this, and this, and this? Yesterday, Diego came up to me and said, Craig, I want us to be very gentle. I'm like thinking, well, well, of course. No, no, no. I mean, I'm serious. Like, they've been through a lot. Let's, be, let's wrap our arms around them and make sure they know that we're supporting them. So, and, and, and I think really what he was saying is what we all felt. So, yesterday we were trying to do that, and I hope you felt that. Um, you're probably like, ah. Um, and then it's up to you now. So, we're really looking forward to hearing from you guys. Yeah. Hello, everyone hear me? Awesome. So here we are at D'Antonia Golf Course. Golf is dying, and it presents a tremendous opportunity for us to use this with the community to address their needs and global uh, or climate change issues. Uh, oh, all right, used to the space bar. <laughs> so we are a group of nine residents from six distinct disciplines. And this is what we first agreed on, our guiding intention for this project. So we wanted to develop an inclusive and diverse space that supports long-term ownership and identity of place, permeating beyond the site's boundary. But implementing this is a whole nother story. As you can see here, there's three different designs here. And once we got to put our pens on papers, we started doing it in our own, within our own lenses, informed by our own traditions of our disciplines and our own dis personal dispositions. But what we did learn from this is that there are some commonalities across these different perspectives. One is that we really valued this idea of a community hub in order to kickstart any sort of, uh, I guess, reform of the community or rejuvenization of the community and the ecology. And two, it's this ravine that runs through this uh, site. So from a policy lens, uh, the Ravine Rejuvenation and the Community Hub were two policy, or are two policy uh, priorities for the City of Toronto. Um, so grounding our approach and kind of aligning all our views together, we used the um, Community Hub Development Framework that's from uh, the City of Toronto. And it's composed of three different phases. 
So first phase we named take down the fence. So intention behind that is to really engage the community and just say hi and say, look at this space and just welcome them and establish rapport. Second step is this idea of co-creation. So really coming together, talking about the land, sharing some important information about the land, and then seeing what the community values and preferences are. And then three, it's dream. So taking that knowledge that we exchanged in the co-creation phase and translating that into some ideas and ways that we can meet the needs, climate and population needs of that community. So I'll hand this off to Liam. Uh, thanks, Nelson. So I'm going to be taking everyone through uh, the physical context of the site. I'll try not rehash anything that was already said by Michael, gave a really comprehensive, awesome analysis of the site. Uh, so we're located in Scarborough, uh, and I wanted to highlight two main uh, scales. One, the regional and global scale, and two, the local and neighborhood scale, which we'll get into a bit more. Uh, notably, uh, at the regional scale, it's located within the City of Toronto's Ravine Network. Uh, that provides a really awesome opportunity uh, to manage stormwater and also mitigate uh, climate change, flooding events, and provide ecological biodiversity throughout the city. Zooming in a bit, uh, we see the site a bit closer within that ecological network. And what I want to highlight here are two things. Uh, and very notably, uh, the golf course represents a distinct uh, separation within that ecological network. And as also mentioned, there are a lot of non-native uh, toxic species uh, that we do think of when we think of golf courses, but they're also very common within the Ravine network as a whole. Zooming in uh, just a bit further, uh, it, it's very clear that this doesn't just represent a break in the ecological network, but also a break within the physical human connections. Uh, so there's a trail on either side, the west and east of the ravine, uh, that right now pedestrians and cyclists have to move north up a steep hill through a neighborhood and back down. The city right now has a potential proposed trail that would go through the site if the use on the site was to change. And then looking at the site, uh, and so we can visualize it finally, uh, we have some, some little comic bubbles, uh, and imaginary things that people might be saying around the site. We wanna highlight a number of things. Again, I won't try and rehash anything that was said, uh, one of the main features is that it is a private site and there's a distinct disconnection between the site's use right now and the public use uh, in the surrounding area. Uh, just to the north, uh, we see mostly single family homes. Uh, the southwest, southeast and northeast dominated by uh, high, uh, high rise residential buildings. And very notably, uh, there is a Victoria Park Metro Station right here. Uh, the area is very well served by uh, transportation as a whole with a number of bus routes running around it. Um, speaking of the site now itself, uh, it's very topographically interesting. Uh, the ravine drops off very steeply into the stream down here. Uh, the only two actual buildable areas of the site that aren't within the floodplain are on the, the south portion here and the northwest portion here. Uh, and finally, because it is uh, a landscape site, it represents some really interesting views. So we took a few photos uh, just to give you guys uh, the ability to visualize the site. I know for me, when I was there, one of the most striking things was being on a fairly isolated site with uh, very dramatic sight lines, but being surrounded by high rises. Um, also, uh, the, uh, the topography itself is very interesting. As I mentioned, it is landscaped, and that's something that we'd want to take advantage of uh, with any future designs, rather than trying to redesign it, work with what we already have. Finally, in the top left, uh, we wanted to include a shot of Victoria Park Avenue itself and its boundary with the site. Uh, there, there is the fence, as we mentioned, that represents a very distinct separative boundary. And it also represents a potential uh, boundary that could be reactivated, whether uh, that's a park, whether that's uh, an urban development, whatever it may be, it's an interesting thing to consider. So I'll now pass it off to Ashley, who's gonna go over a bit more of the social context of the site. So this is going to be interesting because now I'm juggling three things. All right, so to start um, with this, we wanted to really look at what the people and the services were around the area because we realized that this, this site is within a broader community uh, space beyond just the golf course um, and that this can be a space that's used by people surrounding. Um, so in 
this. Um, I just have a few places that are highlighted. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I need this yet. Mm -hmm. So um, some things to look at. So a few areas is there are, um, there's youth services around the site. There's also community services everywhere. Um, one thing that is really um, neat about this space is that there are tons of cultural support centers as well. So there is a, a Bangladeshi Canadian Community Service Organization. There's Islamic societies and centers, um, as well as heritage centers. So very diverse. Um, there's also a few child care centers, but really only one really close. And then there's a few that are further away. Um, but another thing to note is that a lot of the services are really centralized around here and there's not as much in the Northeast section. Um, and so one thing to think about is um, if the people around um, these areas, the Northeast side, are using these services that are further away from them, or is there a opportunity um, for our space to be a hub for that? But that will um, come with really talking to the community and seeing where they go and how this space can really facilitate the engagement of the services around. Um, so with this, it really is um, all of these spaces can be important access points for engaging people in this area, uh, establishing relationships with existing groups, but also understanding that there are services offered so that we don't have to duplicate efforts um, as well. So we also wanted to look at uh, what are some of the demographic um, characteristics of the people surrounding as well. So there are um, children as well as some seniors in the area that do have um, some dependencies on um, some dependencies on their families, um, as well as there are uh, refugees in the area, um, quite a few people that are on social assistance. Um, the unemployment rates are fairly high. Um, and there is a huge diverse population of um, Bangladeshi, Filipino, and indigenous groups in the area. So thinking about some of these demographic characteristics. And then, so this is um, a design thinking technique. Um, and we wanted to use it because we, we haven't had the opportunity to talk to community groups in the area yet. And so just thinking about some of the, um, the people that we could be supporting in this area, it can be beneficial. So thinking about these personas. So we have this idea of um, so the current population, so who is actually in the area, um, the future population. So that could be um, including potential climate refugees or other people in crisis or other people that want to come to the site. Um, as well as indigenous groups in the area um, or surrounding. And then we also thought of the ecology as a kind of persona. So we want to be able to um, rejuvenate and reclaim that land as well. So um, this yeah, would also be a beneficial tool. So what does phase one look like? Phase one is really about uh, the immediacy, the getting started right now. Um, it's about taking down the barriers that currently exist on the site to open it up so that we can start having that discussion about, about what this could really be long term. And we already have the infrastructure in place to do that. We have a clubhouse building. It's got what we need to get started. It's got doors, we can open them up, we can start bringing people in to have that discussion, to, to, to start building trust and rapport with the community, with the people around the site. It has an opportunity to speak with some of the community groups that Ashley just highlighted and find out if there are gaps in the services that they're currently providing. Um, maybe there's uh, an opportunity for a shared space there or um, maybe it's just our, our communal meeting place where we start having the conversations about what's going to happen here. But the point is that it's already there. We don't have to do anything to get this started. We love the idea of having a big community event. It's a tearing down the fence event. It's a come meet the site event. It's um, you know, a chance for us to see how people want to use the site and allow them to explore it and just 
you know, we've talked about desire lines, like seeing where people go once it's not a golf course anymore, once it's not prescriptive as to how you move through the landscape. And just thinking about some of the different community events that we could have here. And Charlotte will speak to a bit more to that. Thank you. Actually, mm -hmm. my apologies, Charlotte. The other thing that we wanted to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I completely forgot to uh, speak to what happens to the landscape in the first phase. I mean, we, we, we we're talking about the hub and the ravine um, and how are, I've spoke to how we're gonna act, how we'd like to activate the hub. Um, but it's also about the landscape and, and thinking about um, immediate things that we could start to do in the ravine um, restoration wise and the potential that this, is, this has a stewardship angle to it um, where we're looking for expertise in the community or inviting people to become a part of remediating this landscape. And I really apologize for the false handoff. <laughs> No problem, Kevin. <laughs> um, so just building on that, once the fence is down, there provides immense opportunities to engage people with the site. Speaking on our mission statement, we have a diverse um, community around us. So in bringing those people in to allow for inclusive activities and meet the diversity of people that are in the surrounding areas. Also, by taking down the site and inviting people on, it emphasizes that this is their place. It emphasizes ownership um, as well as their cultural diversity. So some examples could be recreational opportunities as well as events or cultural activities. And food is always good. Summer similarly can take advantage of the rolling typologies or topographies um, such as perhaps a music event or a theater, um, theater performance, or even a movie night for the community. That has been very successful in Toronto as well. And now I'll pass it off to Ashley, who will explain a little further of what are the next steps. Yeah, so Kevin really mentioned um, this idea of, um, so in phase one is this idea of uh, tearing down barriers, um, making a place of conversation. And so the second phase, co-creation, would be around digging deeper and um, bringing expert knowledge into this um, to, to help kind of facilitate some areas of growth, but then also hearing the expert perspectives of the community that's surrounding. Um, it will also be an opportunity to listen and to learn and show examples and get feedback in this area. And just building off of that, feedback needs to be from both people. So in order to co-create, we need to have an exchange of information from both the design team as well as the community. So some things to highlight are perhaps not all the information is available to the community. So bringing in specialists such as um, Brendan and um, educating the people about the site, <laughs> such as Brendan. For example, specialists, specialists such as on invasive species, on rewilding, um, as well as social issues that deal with refugees. Perhaps it's a community testimony of somebody that's in the community that can speak on this. So people can understand uh, what are we dealing with with the site. After engaging with the site, what are opportunities available ecologically as well as socially on the site. So to extend on that, housing has been something we've all been considering on the site. Having a thesis focus that is working with housing vulnerable populations, one major thing, um, one major important factor is community knowledge and information. Often, not in my backyard, happens when people are misinformed or ignorant about the ideas of refugees or people that are in need of housing. By educating the people, it starts that dialogue for an eagerness for the community to welcome people and start that discussion about housing on the site. Because it will be in their backyard. 
this is a neighborhood that would be extending because that's a buildable area. And this is right where they pass through every day by the transit. So that is our approach to the housing strategy. In addition, another way of community engagement is by introducing exciting examples of interventions into the landscape as well as architectural interventions. For instance, at Sydney Park, they use these large stones to make a fun way to navigate across the wetland while still preserving the na nature around it. By presenting an idea such as this, we can start having that dialogue, no pun intended, <laughs> um, with the community of what can they see on the site? What do they want? What does that look like for them? And, and provide us with feedback that can filter into the design. And now, uh, Alex is going to speak on, on, the, on dreaming about those possibilities. So phase three is all about dreaming. Creative, inclusive possibilities that really feed off of the momentum, the energy that was developed in phase one of the project, tearing down that fence. Uh, phase two of the project, consulting with the community. Um, and during this time, we're really allowing opportunity for the site to gain its own identity. So from phase one and phase two, those really provided a framework for dreaming, um, which can then materialize onto the site, which is our hub. So this is uh, a hub of activity, not acting as one singular space, but as a place um, for the entire site, for a place for community uh, to permeate beyond the boundaries of the physical site and into the community at large and providing a place for growth and for learning. So dreaming, what does this place look like? What could this place be? What could this place feel like? Uh, the hub is really a physical web of all these connections coming together, connecting people, connecting community, connecting ecology, um, not only within, but throughout the entire community. So thanks, Alex. Uh, speaking of the connectedness between human and human, or human and nature, we are dreaming on the programs and the services that this site as a this whole site as a hub uh, could provide. Um, this program shouldn't be decided by a single perspective of the architects, the designer, or the government. It should be decided by the community itself to address the needs and desires of the community uh, with the inputs and knowledge sharing from the experts. So take one example from the list, which is, for example, the wetland development. It can provide the habitat area for animals, uh, revive the ravine, and improve the, eco, the local ecosystem that uh, wetland uh, can also be a place where people experience or enjoy their natural elements. Um, or another example is the community barbecue party that can bring people with different backgrounds together, share their relationship, and uh, by that create their, um, the sense of belonging. So to the far end, um, this program can always revolving to adapt to the, 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 the diverse and changing that community. Uh, so as part of our vision, one of the, the major components was the, the creek corridor and the riparian zone. So if you look at the before photo, uh, we're looking at the Victoria Park Bridge and it's a big giant block uh, there's a culvert running through it, and this acts as a, a barrier and a constriction in many senses of the word. So what we envisioned was having uh, a very open bridge, which helps to function in a few ways. It increases our flood conveyance capacity. It also establishes a connection between uh, the ecological corridors from the east and west, and it allows us to extend the trail system to allow people to connect with nature running through. Uh, one component that we have an opportunity to do here is to provide creek restoration and that will take the form of a few number of ways for example 
taking out the concrete that's currently serving as tow protection in the creek and is essentially restricting the, the creek's desire to move and meander around the, the floor of the valley. Another aspect is to uh, incorporate pocket wetland features. So to increase biodiversity and allow an interaction between a wetland ecosystem and a river corridor ecosystem during uh, regular flooding events. Uh, we would also like to remove the invasive tree species that currently inhabit the site and essentially the entire ravine network and much of Toronto and replace those with some native species that unfortunately have, uh, have been lost within the city and essentially just uh, bring back some of the biodiversity. Uh, one, one aspect that we all kind of felt was pretty critical in the natural environment was to uh, allow people to interact with the water and feel one with nature, improve mental health. And one way we can do that is putting in a, a boardwalk, extend the trail through the wetlands, and then also incorporate um, a alluvial gravel component that feeds into the meander belt of the stream and may one day be eroded and supply sediments to the natural progression of erosion and sedimentation in the stream. The, the final com component that we wanted to incorporate was uh, touching on reconciliation. So perhaps having an educational plaque, plaques along the trail to recognize which communities, indigenous communities may have inhabited the site previously to it becoming a golf course, how it developed to a golf course, and what it might serve in the future. So, leave it at that. Building on some of Matt's points about more site-specific context, we're also looking at community engagement from the point of creating opportunities where it isn't necessarily site-specific, where we can have a communal kitchen just about anywhere on the site. We could have a community garden, we can have parks infrastructure, we can have just about anything to create more biodiversity, create community engagement, as well as uh, more opportunities for engagement with different people. We've built here a framework from the ground up about community engagement. We're focusing in the first phase about building relationships. We want to establish trust. Without trust, there can be no further discourse and actions often deemed exclusive. In the second phase, we're talking about gathering information, giving information, talking about what we can do together, using expertise, but also using the expertise of those living in, this, in the region. In the third phase, we talk about dreams, empowering the community to build off those, off those points, to give them a source of manifesting their dreams in a spectacular way. We, as a team, we approach this from with inclusivity, with diversity, with ownership, with identity and a boundlessness, highlighting the community's engagement as a focal point. We from nine different, as nine students from different disciplines, this is our dream for the future. What's yours? Thank you. Well, thank, thanks a lot, everyone. I mean, I think I can speak on behalf of um, all of Dialogue, everyone who's gathered here, and say that you've done an excellent job. As you were speaking, I started to reflect on an activity that we did earlier in the week where we asked you what success looked like and what, lo what it looked like for you at the end of this week. You spoke about wanting to be ambitious, wanting to propose something that's sympathetic and context sensitive and has an element of grassroots as well to it. You also spoke a lot about wanting to be a good team member and really support each other. And I think you've done all those things. So I think you deserve another round of applause. So we're gonna take some questions, Q&A, comments, and, those, and that. Um, we've got a few levels to it. We're gonna start with our, our panelists. Um, and we're gonna set you up with a couple of microphones, one of which I'm holding. Um, and then we'll have a couple of microphones for the floor. Um, we'll start with the panelists and then I think we'll open it up to the floor. And then um, I think as you've gathered, we've got um, our other studios who are videoed in. Hi, other studios. Um, and we're gonna open it up to them for some questions and comments, okay? Cool. 
Sure. Discussion? Yeah, absolutely. Why don't, yeah, if someone want to do that. And then maybe if I can ask the residents to come up to the front too. You got me? Yeah, okay. Um, so panelists, um, not to put any of you on the spot, but wondering if there's any uh, initial reactions or if anyone wants to kick us off with a comment or a question for the residents. Amelia? The work is fabulous. You've really had a very comprehensive analysis of the site and the fact that it's so isolated. Actually, I think you need to use this mic. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would start by just echoing my sincere congratulations to all of you. Um, I'm completely blown away by how, uh, first of all, how evident it is um, that you've worked together so well. And even, even just little things like, you know, acknowledging each other's names and introducing each other as you go through. I mean, it just, it just feels so much like you guys are a team. Um, it's so clear. And that's, wonderful to see um, and speaks to the whole program, I think. Um, so congratulations on that. I think also um, the way that you've pulled this together into a narrative, um, I, would, I would just maybe point out how, how strong I think the project is because of you've given it a very clear framework and, you, and uh, it's evident that you've, you've kind of gone through this and there have been iterations and there's been, <laughs> I'm, seeing, I'm seeing some nodding heads. Um, you know, and storyboarding and sort of, uh, you know, showing us the images of, of sort of workshopping these ideas and, and pulling it together, um, presenting it in terms of these phases, and then also very clearly articulating the sort of purpose of each phase and how it ties into these, these kind of guiding thesis statement. It's very easy to follow. Um, and I think the graphic support for that was also very effective. So I think the format, you know, works really well. Uh, and it's impressive that you pulled, <laughs> pulled that off so quickly. Um, can I just one question? So, with the, in, I think it's in phase one where you propose a physical hub. Um, actually, maybe it's good to go back to the map because my question is about where or the bird's eye. Where, where is that? You, you mentioned that there's there's already a, a, a totally um, obvious location to start having some kind of physical hub. So, where is that on the site? I missed that. Sorry. Okay, perfect. Um, the, the one observation I would make, and then I'll pass this on uh, for others, is um, the, I think the phased approach, you know, it makes perfect sense. And the idea that it's iterative and there's all these opportunities for um, feedback and use and patterns to, to really inform what ultimately makes sense, because how, how could you possibly know that otherwise? Um, what it reminded me of is, is how, going back and taking a historical perspective, it's sort of analogous in some ways to the royal hunting grounds in, say, London, uh, uh, slowly turning into what became kind of the models, the prototypes for the, the great public parks of North America. So I, I don't know that history inside out, but I know that, you know, it's interesting because those, those were designed as sort of pleasure grounds for hunting and parading and doing different things for the few. Um, and I understand that part of the transition to those becoming public had to do with sort of opening the gates every once in a while. And then eventually it was just sort of like, hey, like, maybe we should have something called parks. Like, what's a park? And it's like a new idea. Um, and I, I love the idea that, like, that would be such a wonderful way to figure out how a landscape like this that's been purpose-designed for something, the same way a parade ground had, or a hunting ground had been designed for 
hunting um, could eventually evolve into a park. And what does that look like? And also, I think once you open the gates, it's sort of like, it's just inevitable. That's the thing that's really exciting about it too, is that it just becomes, you know, the, the opportunities become so clear, I think. Um, anyway, I'll pass it on. Uh, there might be specifics. I actually really wanted to build on the congratulations, it was, it was great. I, the teamwork was fantastic. Um, I think that one of the most powerful parts of the narrative um, for me, there was two things. The first was the, the very powerful taking down the fence. Um, when I was, when Michael sent me the design challenge, it reminded me of a, of a, a podcast from Malcolm Gladwell that I listened to where he talked about this, these, the golf courses in Los Angeles and how they're the only open space around. And the first, and he gets like spoiler alert if you haven't heard it, but he gets to a point of just like, take down the fence right? Let me run on the golf course on weekends. So like that is a, such a clear and, and the, the idea of it being a publicly owned site, but privatized in a way because I can't, as a citizen of the city and as a, as a local-ish resident, I'm just, uh, just West End Brad's Ward actually, um, I, I, eventually I can't, I have to stop running and then just like go around this area because I'm not paying my green fee that day, um, which I have. And if you found any of my balls down there, that's great. Um, but the also... And I don't know whether this was intentional, and I would kind of put it to the group, but there's a, there was an underlying thing as you went through that your narrative and your framework about, um, which really, and, and I'll let some of my natural ecology colleagues on the panel talk about this, really paralleled nature. You're, you're, you're not kind of coming in, and, and, and as landscape architects, as architects, as planners, so heaven help us, um, we want to go in and see what happens, and, and we put these... Amelia and I go to community meetings all the time when we put up these 25 year visions and the community thinks it's arriving tomorrow. There is a lot of, um, a lot of really careful thought put into the organic nature of how the site is going. And I use the word organic purposely, how the organic nature of the site is going to play out over time. And you start with the seed, right? The clubhouse, Re just repurposing that space, making it more democratic, making it more accessible, much like when you're Again, this is all off my corner. When you're renaturalizing or changing areas, you're starting with, you know, very deliberate but very cautious interventions into the landscape, and then over time, organically with community impact and community feedback, kind of creating this new space. It's it's really just to take a, a kind of standing back on my corner now. We're dealing with this in Scarborough, particularly with recreation, soccer field or um, hockey arenas. Right, Scarborough was built, and every, so it was like it was a it was a school, a hockey arena, and a legion, and these sort of sites permeated everywhere. And um, that community is is not those constituencies are not necessarily. So we're we're actually repurposing hockey arena spaces for uh, indoor soccer for uh, the big one of the biggest needs in this part of the city, and in, in Don Mills and Eglinton, where I'm working as well on on another project from my old world cricket pitches. Um, the, the, the new arrivals to Toronto, the new arrivals to Canada are looking for places to, um, to enjoy recreation that is more in tune with what they want to do. One of the fastest growing uh, needs in Toronto is pickleball, um, which I had never even heard about. Um, and I, st I, still don't, I still don't think I understand. Is there a jar involved? I'm not sure. Um, but, but your, your deliberateness and, and, like, and, I, and I knew that you were thinking about these ideas because some of your imagery pointed at it, but deliberately allowing those things to organic, much like seeds, much like the natural bit is going to organically happen over time as you start to stop cutting the grass and not raking the bunkers and, and all these kinds of things. The community aspect of it is going to happen organically too. And it shows such discipline, which I really appreciate because every day, Amelia and I with the city, we deal with deterministic thinkers of like, it's going to be this tall and this wide and this much green space. And we have our standards and guidelines that sort of almost spit that out for the site sometimes, but it shows a lot of discipline to kind of let it happen and, and let, let the community kind of, and I really appreciate that. And I thank you for it. Um, I, I love the whole thing. It was really, really interesting. It gave me a lot of ideas. One, one thing that really jumps out is the desire lines. I forget who mentioned that. And, and the river going through there is so central. And w when I look at the complex next to it, um, I'm kind of even wondering if you can walk through there comfortably. And um, it just seems like a really revolutionary idea to have a path and a river right through the middle of such a large site. And uh, I was, I guess, wondering, have you, have you thought about where you'd place the buildings or, or any, maybe if you could, if you had any more ideas on that, it would be neat to hear about or? I mean, we were considering uh, the most level areas to the south and to the north as just a 
opportunities for housing, opportunities for built form, strictly maintaining the natural ecology of the ravine, making sure that, that was most prominent. So just making sure that that separation was most prominent. Yeah, I mean, I guess in the in that whole area, there probably is not a lot of easily accessible public river trail mm -hmm. sections. I, I mean, I guess the TRCA folks would know more, but east and west you kind of can, but it's east. it's a deliberately enclaved away. Yeah. So they, there was a slide where they showed how you then have to go up through the main yeah. and then come back down. Okay. The culvert allows the river. There's no path. That's why they bridge it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it almost seems like some of your ideas could inform adjacent developments, like getting more, um, you know, I mean, you think about uh, walkability in urban planning, livability, that like that seems like a really, you know, so, some of these adjacent sites could take some lessons from this and update their grounds to make them more livable and walkable and beautiful. And so, yeah, it's just really great. I'll pass along. Yeah, this was this was awesome. Really, really cool ideas. Um, one of the one of the things I wanted to point out that I was really, really excited to see is um, in my work, what we're finding more and more often is given the scarcity of land and, the, and land costs within the GTA, um, public spaces and, and some private spaces are being asked to provide more than one function. Um, in terms of, of uh, community and neighborhood design. Um, so uh, in a greenfield scenario, you might see um, a public park being asked to provide uh, stormwater function and then layering on top of that some kind of a um, uh, uh, active recreation function. Um, simply because land is is so expensive now that having the giant swim pond next to the the programmed park um, is becoming more and more difficult to deliver and um, what i how i want to uh, point out that it was applied to this project is um, on slide 25 which i think is spectacular it hits so many of the points that that we work towards every day um, what you've got there is the bridge, um, which is one of the first things that I would, I would strive for with this site in terms of opening it up. So it's gonna be a big help from a flood conveyance perspective. Um, from a ecological perspective, it's gonna provide some, uh, uh, an increase in connectivity through the site. Um, but at the same time, it is providing that, that trail connection. And that hill is really hard to get up. It's a real pain, and the number of the number of people the number of people that turn around there and head back downtown or go to Sunnybrook or whatever um, uh, it's a huge pain to navigate around that um, and I think that that notion of of uh, uh, doubling up is represented really well here um, and uh, another point is. Um, one thing that we deal with all the time in, in Toronto ravines is needing construction access for existing infrastructure down there. And that's what the trail can provide as well. We can, we can really ask these, these uh, ravines to do a whole lot more than just provide habitat um, while we've, we've got some, some huge uh, opportunities to, to increase that function. And I would just echo what Brad said. I see a lot of creativity here. I think you've embraced these challenges really, really well. Um, these are spaces that are really neglected in, in a lot of corners of the city. And as we become a more vertical city, it's really important that a lot of these areas act as backyards, people who just, they don't have them. Um, and I really like that, like uh, Christian was saying, the take down the fence, you're really improving connectivity, not just for um, uh, floodwaters and um, uh, ecological needs but also for community and that's great. I had one question that doesn't maybe my community planning counterparts can speak to. Um, I wondered if there are any community safety issues in this area and um, whether that had come up at any point in any of your your discussions over the last few days. I think Charlotte's looking for a microphone. Um, yeah we, we've had some discussions um, about community safety and we think um, Open it, opening up the site and 
providing like these events to allow for people to see how it could be safe um, is the first kind of engage in that conversation. And then um, allowing the community to give feedback of their concerns that can be addressed. So some things that we explored was like a central pathway that is lit that directs people. So there's more traffic directed in one area, um, like especially from the transit hub to the other houses that people are already using that as a pathway to get home. So building on those like lines of desire and making it a place that people want to be. And uh, strategies, Matthew was, um, Matthew and Kevin were, they were working on this bridge. Um, they're also considering that too. It, when we do interventions, we need to make sure that the connectivity is a place that people feel safe in. So instead of making an underpass um, approach, or a dark area, um, like let, let, let's go all out, let's make it beautiful and also uh, welcoming. Uh, is this an answer question? Yeah. Here, I, I, I could say something mm -hmm. too. Uh, and just to echo what, what you just said and also uh, what you were mentioning about having a multitude of uses on the site and how important that is, mm -hmm. especially in, in very dense cities right now. Uh, and I think we collectively agreed that having a ton of uses having you know, day camps uh, for kids, having uh, just connections, linkages between the community from the north to the south, uh, whether it's a little bridge over the stream or, and a trail along the side is really important just to create that use, make people feel safe so they're not walking through isolated areas. So I think really the bringing a, a large variety of uses was really important to create that sense of safety. Thanks. Uh, Thrilled to death. My name is Mike Bell. I'm a landscape architect from Des Moines, Iowa. And yes, I came to hear you. <laughs> and that's a neat thing. I, two things I'd like to talk about. The project's wonderful. First of all, I live on a repurposed golf course, the first golf course near us, or first uh, country club in the city of Des Moines. We would benefit if we'd asked the questions that you asked. We live in a wonderful neighborhood, but it's not nearly as diverse. They forgot to put a park in our neighborhood because who needs it? It was a golf course. So the, the, there are a series of things that you talked about that, gosh, if we had another three days, I'd love to sit here and talk to you. Second, and the thing I'd like to talk about, um, you will never know, you may down the road, but Donna, all of you who have worked on this project, who have built this from scratch, you will remember this for the rest of your lives. And that's an amazing thing. For the people who put this on, you'll remember it. And more importantly, you won't know this, but in a couple years from now, you'll run into each other and you'll start a network. And what the only thing I would ask is if you could help them start that network today. That's an amazing thing. And I mean the pun. We are better together through dialogue if we can only do a better job talking early. Thanks. Uh, Mike, as it turns out, we talked last night about the network after we came back from dinner with you and Doug, and there will be a network and it will be Facebook and it will be private network just for them and the past years. So <laughs> they will be able to talk to themselves for the rest of time. Um, I, I, I'd, I'd like to ask a, a question and I've been sitting here smiling and thinking, wow, this is awesome. And, and thank you very much for the questions because I think they really do reflect what we've been seeing all of the people that have participated in, in, in giving feedback and so forth. Instead of asking a content question, I'd like to ask a process question. And that is, what did you think was the most difficult thing or difficult things about approaching and then coming to terms with and, and resolving um, this challenge? Um, Personally, uh, I don't want to speak for the entire group, uh, but I think dealing with such a variety of challenges, usually in school, we're told to specifically attack this one problem, get a very specific idea. But in the context of dealing with ecology, climate change, refugees, just saying those three words, it, it creates, you, you don't know what to do. There's no specific solution. So I think the biggest challenge for us is understanding where our priorities are uh, as designers and understanding because we don't have like one specific topic and choosing not to neglect the others, we have to be 
uh, conscious of community engagement. And that's why, sort, that's why that was sort of the preceding notion that we wanted to attack everything from. But for us, I think the difficulty was having set so many challenges. Coming from a healthcare policy lens, like I think we're make, in healthcare we're moving away from this paternal approach to these problems. And that slide number three, I think, where we had the three images, those were, it was actually a bit of a social, social experiment within the group to see, well, what did the landscape architectures think uh, about, about the site? What did the architects think about the site? <laughs> and what did the miscellaneous think about the site? <laughs> That's why this one looks a bit like an amusement park. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think, I mean, going back to my healthcare policy lens, I think we're exploring this idea of co-creation. Like, really, we need to design a space for people. And I thought it was really interesting to see this and see the actual need that it's not only in the healthcare context, but it's in all contexts. Once we get excited about a project, we're going to be like, they're going to love this, but are they really going to love it? So I think, I think Ashley said the first day, without really this consultation, like we don't feel comfortable or you, even like, you know, saying this should be here or this should be there. So that kind of informed, like, let's go back look at this from high level and kind of see how we can make it in a way that's responsible and reflexive to the needs of the population. So. Yeah, I think just, just to build on both those things, it's taking all of those ideas and that excitement and not just like smoldering it at all, but building off all those key ideas and weaving it into that framework, weaving it into that story, I think, we, we all worked really hard on that because we wanted it to read clearly and we didn't want to lose those magics that each of us provided to the project. Um, so I think from my personal standpoint, that was like the most uh, engaging um, aspect of it and challenging aspect is once you got all these ideas, how can we direct them and make it one project? I think I, just to answer the opposite question, um, <clears throat> the most beneficial aspect um, I think is the diversity of, of backgrounds here that, that you put together. We were complimented in some ways for restraint, you know, in terms of the proposal. We owe that to certain group members who, who grounded us and held us back. And that's because of the variety of backgrounds that we have in, in community engagement and policy and planning and sort of the, the juxtaposition of that allowed us to sort of weave this together in a way that that kind of worked so compliments to the creation of the team i guess thanks very much kevin and thank you uh, now we'll go to one of the studios uh calgary does calgary have any questions and let's see if we can make this work questions anyone here oh i think yeah. I got a question for you guys. Um, first of all, great job. Um, I came here to basically see how this all played out, and I think it's been a remarkably like wonderful experience and sort of inspiring for us for next year. So thank you for that, guys. Um, I I don't know if it was intentionally topical, but I think your first step of sort of taking down the wall, sort of in light of the context of our very peculiar southern neighbors these days. Um, I, <laughs> I think, I think that's a wonderful step um, to think about taking down a wall to specifically serve an immigrant community. I think that's exactly the right, the right place to start this. Um, and just in regards to the, the design residency, and you kind of answered the question already, so you're not allowed to answer this one. Um, but was there any, can you give me a moment during the week where the, the fact that it was this interdisciplinary group of kind of, you know, people that didn't know each other four days ago, can you describe a moment at which you behaved differently because of the way that this group was composed and the sort of turned the path? I could speak a bit. I can't think of an exact um, moment right now. I was reflecting on it a lot before, but even just looking at this image, for me, this was like such a, a perfect way to understand some of the disciplines that I wouldn't have really had an opportunity to know too much about before. But just like hearing from landscape architectures and architectures, like, wow, this is a completely different lens. Um, and it's really great to be able to amalgamate them and, and think of the possibilities as well as the commonalities between them. So that was 
that was a glorious first step for us um, because this was the first, well, after we created um, that kind of like guiding principle, after we did that, this was the first thing that we did. And it was kind of great to see um, how we could put that concept into practice. Um, and it like started to build our story. So that, yeah, was really great for me. I think sort of building on that, the first day when we went to site, we not only discussed from the perspective of architects and uh, landscape architects, but understanding that health policy, community engagement, engineering, it's very, they have different perspectives. You, you still get that wow moment and understanding that it's, it was, there was commonality amongst us was sort of like the turning point. Even the moment, there were key moments when we were having our discussions where everybody was like, yes, let's do it. Like one, one of those moments was take down the fence and everybody was like, yes, just let's do that. Let's take that. And it sort of began, to, that was essentially the turning point. That was when we said, okay, so what happens when you take up down the fence? So, and then everything started to build uh, after that. I think this, this, op this was an opportunity to see what everybody's perspective was, but it did it and it outlined some of the practical features that we all noticed from the site. But when we started to talk about it from our own lenses, from our own perspectives, it really came down to boundaries and community. To that. I think I think the first pinup on the first day was really a eye-opening moment for us. I kind of we kind of got ripped a little bit, but um, <laughs> but I think it it forced us to take a step, really take a step back and think about like, well, what are other people thinking? And there was no narrative with this. Like we presented this, like we would get ripped again, and no one would be like, oh, you did a great job. So I mean, I think a lot of it was that that moment and like really kind of grounding ourselves in this project rather than our own individual like the dispositions and traditions of our, you know, disciplines. So. And not to avoid the question of what was the major event, but I think it's important to recognize there was a lot of little small successes. Like for example, this process, we almost didn't do it. It was uh, when we were splitting into groups, we had like a two minute discussion mode. Should we just integrate everyone into a uh, group? So every group is mixed. And it was kind of a split, split second decision. It's like, no, let's just, we'll have all the landscape architects together, the architects together, and I guess everyone else in the other group. Uh, and, and so a lot of small things like that really did inform our process and worked out really well. Uh, and so even during that process, like drawing a bridge somewhere and the civil engineer being like, if you put a bridge there, it's going to be completely temporary. <laughs> and having, having those things happen, but having those, having those small discussion points that just uh, really really drove our thinking points forward. I think that was really important. So I, I think taking down the fence definitely uh, was a huge event, but I think there was a lot of small events that happened over the past two days. It's a bit of a blur, but I think there were a lot there that, uh, that were really important. These maps were instinctual. They were done in 30 minutes. <laughs> Okay. Any, anyone from Calgary have a question there? Uh, hi, this is Tracy Liu from Calgary. I was hi. just curious to ask the panelists, um, if you had one more day of charretting, where do you think you would take it next? Great question. They meant they meant us? Okay. No, you, you guys. Does anybody else want to speak first? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Go please, home. Please don't okay. <laughs> um, I think actually very concisely, we, when we looked at the community hub framework, it, it's an established framework where you do talk about vision, you talk about assessment, you talk about planning. And I think we got to the plan planning stage, but we haven't gotten to the build and sustainability stage. We haven't gotten to the point where Yes, you build it, and then you need to review on what you've built. So we get community engagement, we get information, we do the planning with the community, and something gets built. But from that point, I think that it's a loop, it's as opposed to a three-step program and ending it and moving somewhere else. I think once, if we had more time, I think developing not the three stages, but moving to a, uh, the second level of framework where it is about build feedback, build feedback, and constantly refining it to make sure that we aren't 
um, I guess, turning our backs to some of the issues because in, in every design solution, at least in my own experience, we choose specific things that we want to focus on and then sometimes things get lost. And then we realize those things that we've put away are actually the bigger picture and they actually have detrimental effects. So it's always this feedback loop that I think we, we could have an opportunity to refine. We're gonna do a follow-up from Calgary and then go to Vancouver. So is there a follow-up from um, Calgary? Well, I think I can make a comment to Craig, this is Jim. Hi, Jim. I, uh, I, think, I think the group made a very, very, very strong case for maintain, after you take down the fences, after you, you build the bridges, you develop a hub and that for trying to maintain this, uh, this piece of property uh, almost forever as a park. And, and I know there are other parks beside it, but as a combination of parks. And, and I, would, I would hesitate to allow any um, housing development on any part of that. I think there was, there was a panelist that, that mentioned earlier, I think that you know, the things you can do with this may, may spur other development, private development uh, beside that to, uh, you know, to do other things like housing and things like that. So I think, you know, once you, you know, you've got this, it's a very precious piece of land. I would keep it as public land, whether there's recreational things in it, and areas like that. And I would use it as a, as something to spur other development. And because as soon as you allow people to, even public housing or anything like that on it, eventually after 10 or 15 or 20 years, they'll start to eat up the whole thing. Jim, I think you need to be on the Calgary team for the next residency. <laughs> yeah, but I'm in, I'm in Toronto most of the time. Okay. <laughs> so Don has a question, then we'll go to Vancouver. So I have um, a comment and a, and a question. Um, so if you go back to the, the bridge shot, um, and I'm probably one of the people that you labeled as uh, gave you a hard time on your first pinup. <laughs> and I challenged you to have a point of view. And that came through clearly that as a team, you have a definite point of view. So kudos. <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't too hard on you. Um, and as part of the um, World Cafe, there was a lot of conversation at the table I was at around, can you restore back um, the site or do you build on what's there? And what's your attitude to that? And I think this slide brilliantly demonstrates your desire to find a balance on the site. The one side feels quite urban and kind of built up and structured, and the other side is much more natural. And I think that's a hugely important part of this conversation because people coming there are going to think about that. They're going to see it and they're going to say, you know what, we have a responsibility to think about sustainability. We have a responsibility to not only think about the community of humans on the site, but to think about the community of plant species, the water, the insects, the birds. And there's this lovely dialogue that's happening across this stream. And I think it's fabulous. So thank you for, for, for sharing that insight um, with us. And my question is to Nelson. <laughs> Day one, mm -hmm. I was having a coffee with you. Mm -hmm. And you were really nervous. And yeah. you were looking around the room and going, I don't know why I'm here. Mm -hmm. So do you, after going through this, do you understand why you're here? And how might that change what you do in the future? Yeah, I think coming in here, I, I had some preconceptions of how I can contribute. And that totally was not the case. Like I was, thought I was going to come in and talk about social determinants of health. How can we improve mental health, well-being in the community or just well-being in general in the community? But I, I think coming in here and just having this opportunity to learn, there's a lot more we, like, we can address, like not the specific healthcare. Like I think in healthcare, we're very targeted in disease, certain diseases and, you know, trying to cure, but there's a big, bigger picture here. And I think hearing everyone's perspective, especially that the first day of presentations, that was just 
mind blowing. I'm like, okay, there's no time to talk about this. Let's uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's kind of figure out like what do we need to do here and you know just focus in and hear what everyone has to say because I think those eventually came out naturally through the dialogue that we unintended <laughs> through that <laughs> through the discussions we had um, amongst the group and I, I I was just thinking yeah you know there's just lots of moments for me to learn and integrate these ideas so I am very thankful for this opportunity. Vancouver, question in Vancouver. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Vance here in Vancouver, um, I have to say we, we've been trying to start our video and unmute our microphone, but we realized early on we were controlled from that end. So um, we, uh, we had a, a great critical mass earlier and uh, folks are dribbling out here, but I, I wanted to, first of all, commend the group uh, to the person, uh, the, the level of confidence and, and clarity in your spoken presentation it far exceeds what I would expect uh, from folks uh, going through uh, professional programs. You know, you're, you're speaking like professionals and that's, that's not to be um, uh, underappreciated. I don't want to derail things too much, but I want to pick up on Craig's comment about process and I'm a little bit uh, selfish in wanting to think of how we can uh, pick on the or pick up the uh, momentum from this year and, and carry it into Vancouver next year. If you could all think of things that worked really, really well, and then don't answer this in public if you don't feel like it, but think of things that didn't work so well for you in the past few days. And I would love to hear about both of those going forward. <laughs> Vance, is there another question or do we go to a question here? Yeah, we can go from there. There was uh, one of our uh, landscape architects had a question and then she was uh, pulled out into another call. So, Okay, there's a landscape architect here that has a follow-up to yours. Sure. Yeah. Um, I've heard multiple times I've been involved in a residency somewhere else. And Nelson, it's your conversation, frankly. Doug, you told me, oh, I got to tell you something. When a guy came in and said, I'm a, public, I'm a person, I am this, and here is my lens. And at the end of it, it's we, and I'm part of the design team. That's an amazing thing. The question I'd ask here is, what voice isn't here? What lens would you like to see through and understand their perspective to make you more effective in what you do. Um, something that quickly comes to mind, I don't know, it would depend on the specific problem in a given year, but imagine that we were able to work through this process with a member of the community the entire time. Like, I don't know, just that would be, that'd be incredible. Yeah, just building off of what, um, Kevin said, and also what Ashley has been saying too about partnerships, is um, if we could work with even one representative of a partnership that's already embedded in the community, um, ideally that would be like a, a diverse embedment, so not just a specific cultural um, uh, organization, uh, but, but something that could really steward the exchange of information and also allow for the sharing of information to the community from like the community to the community. So it's like, it's really exciting. They're thinking about us. Um, and then from there, they can be a part of further conversations on this project. Cause I understand that it's, it's not going to just go away. It is a real project. Mm -hmm. uh, a little less heartwarming now that the kind of community <laughs> engagement stuff's uh, been said, but I think for this specific project, and it might be unique to this project, uh, I think it would have been valuable to have access to an ecologist or biologist. Um, some of the things that were shared with us on the first day during the presentations, for me at least, were really mind opening. And I worked as a geologist for five years before this, and I didn't know how many species within uh, the ravine system in Toronto were actually toxic and don't actually provide an environment uh, for almost any insects in the area. And so just little things like that, 
I think did guide our strategy quite a bit. And um, we really built off the presentation in the first day. If we had access to more of that in the project, I think it might've been a bit more informative as well. Whether that's something on a project in an alleyway in uh, Vancouver, I don't know if a biologist would be as useful, but for this project, I think it would have been informative. Someone say, go to Edmonton. <laughs> go to Edmonton. <laughs> Can you hear us? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, this is Jillian here from Edmonton. Um, first, an observation. Um, I was pretty involved with the design residency last year, and it seemed like the public health perspective was very eye-opening to all the other design disciplines in the group. And it looks like there's a pattern repeating this year with the healthcare lens, uh, lending some really interesting perspectives. So a question for maybe two or three people to answer, uh, what discipline aside from your own was most eye-opening to you? I think for me, it would have been community engagement just because that lends to my own thesis work right now um, and understanding it from the perspective of someone who is involved in that and I can gain influence from in my own professional work, but also specifically to this topic because I found that though this is a, a problem that we just recently adopted um, as, as a team, it became very passionate for us. We, we were always talking, we were always trying to involve the conversation, there wasn't a lull in the conversation. And for me personally, I think it, it was community engagement because that sometimes lacks um, when dealing with architecture in school. Um, well, so for me, I think it's a, um, it was a little bit more than uh, just disciplines. So I really loved hearing everyone's perspectives that wasn't just about their discipline. So we all have different skills that were really prevalent. So I, I got to see some people's drawings that were amazing. And I was like, this is so great. We really need to incorporate this. Or dad had awesome diagrams that worked so well with all of our ideas, but we couldn't exactly figure out how to draw them. Um, so it was just really great to to see what other skills and what other creative aspects we had to bring to the table that wasn't even about our disciplines, but really highlighted the discipline and the skills that we all had as well. So my background is um, actually not related to nature at all. It's health informatics. So the use of information technologies within healthcare. And like from that lens, I feel like, you know, I do bring a design perspective because you're always wondering how you can design information that's better for uptake and how can you make a user experience much better. So coming in, I thought, you know, I had a solid grasp of design principles, but listening to them talk, and though the rest of the gang talk, it's just like everyone has their own kind of lens. And I thought like, you know, design is just this kind of overarching picture, but there are multiple ways of looking at design. And, you know, it was, it was really interesting to just kind of finally see like when, when we get to integrate, like, you know, just design of a landscape or design of the architecture. It, like that second I walked into the room, so we, we split off a bit, the miscellaneous and the architects. <laughs> And then when we walked back into the room and I saw like this image and that, that vignette that you know, Siobhan did at the end, I was just blown away. I was like, that, this is like, you know, it was just that moment. And it really reflects this idea of dream that we talk about in, in our framework. Edmonton, do you have a follow-up question? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. This is Mata from Edmonton, um, and I'm just wondering, for really anybody on the team, how has this experience shaped how you think about your own discipline and how you might um, return to your studies? What might be different for you now? Did everyone hear that? Yeah. Uh, just, just clarify, you asked how uh, does it brought in our perspective of our own discipline and the relationships with others disciplines is okay. that what and your studies and, our, how studies and how it will shape our studies i think uh 
reflecting on the design residency, the collaboration between all disciplines was really cool. Sometimes there's like that um, stereotypical like, oh, the engineers are gonna wreck everything <laughs> or, <laughs> or the landscape architects. Um, we, we don't leave enough money for the landscape architects and it gets cut out of the budget last minute. Um, like, so it's, I didn't know um, being set up with those stereotypes is like how productive of a conversation we're going to have. And, and we had a really great productive conversation and it was really exciting seeing everybody's lens for the future. And I'm glad that like our generation shaping the future um, so that we can access green spaces and such. Um, how it will impact our studies. I think all, I can't speak to all of us, but for me, um, really in engaging with these aspects and not being afraid now that we see different perspectives. So for my thesis project, engaging like with landscape and the potential of like water purification um, elements to weave into my design. Um, and yeah, so I think, and, and as well as like setting up that framework for community engagement um, would also be helpful. Does anyone else have some? Um, I can speak a bit to how I'll inform my studies, but I think it's important to recognize uh, for a lot of us, and definitely myself, I can only fully speak for myself, but uh, this was my first chance to really work collaboratively with a really integrated, diverse team. Uh, my program had three uh, studios. They were awesome, but I'm a planner. I was working with all planners. The architects are on the floor below. They're working with just themselves. Uh, there, was, there, was, there, there was no integration. <laughs> there was no integration and I think that was really missing from the program and having this opportunity to work with architects, to work with engineers, to work with landscape architects, to work with uh, health uh, and informatic professionals was really, really valuable. And for research I'm conducting now, which is specifically on how to develop urban green space, uh, uh, what I was hoping when I came into this was to gain some new lenses to look at how those developments could happen. And for me, that was the most valuable insight towards you know, what I can use for my studies in the future. I think for me, it was definitely the interdisciplinary approach um, and bringing that back to school, remembering that we do have a network of people um, in different disciplines that we have access to and making sure to reach out to them. Uh, because I think often we do get stuck on our floors on our side of the building and remembering that we are allowed to go down the stairs or up the stairs and talk to other people and the same way everyone was here and open to uh, being here during their reading week other people are really open to discussing uh, the different problems and if you're wondering how health could affect uh, a particular landscape going to the health policy person and asking them what their opinions are on your design and not making any assumptions. So uh, uh, I think uh, at the beginning of maybe the second day when we actually started to get into the, the designs and ideas and uh, how we wanted to do some things, um, I think uh, I sounded like a broken record player most of that day um, and maybe not being as open to things I wouldn't have previously considered. And uh, the next day I came back, I kind of thought about it and uh, maybe I should be a little bit more open to what people value rather than how can this actually physically work. Uh, so it, it, it then I think might have translated into uh, this is what we want to do. How can we make it work? and not uh, only limiting the alternatives to consider. So I think uh, everyone had different perspectives than I would have had and uh, brought things that like made this project what it is. And uh, it really took all everyone's heads to get together and uh, come up with what we have, so. So to me specifically, I'm an international student and the way we teach and learn here is completely different from my country. And I really enjoy studying here in Canada. And also this one, this residency is, uni is really unique to me. Um, 
I have some difficulty in the language a little bit. So, so I would like to thank you, you all guys, to understand and acknowledge that. I really appreciate that. Great. So, so um, <clears throat> the last question was the question I was going to ask. So, uh, but I do want to say that I'm kind of hoping that uh, someone will go back to the school and put up like a lost and found board. So beside kittens and cats, like you're looking for an ecologist. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that would be amazing because um, uh, someone said it from when we were in school, we had a very, you know, single, single uh, diverse perspective when we went through school. And you said like we were given one task to learn, one thing to refine, and what we completely lost is the power of working together and, and that diversity. So your comments were fantastic and totally inspiring. Um, and I, I just wanna say uh, yesterday when you went through your run through, you, know, you were given a challenge to make sure that everybody had a voice. And today I just feel like I got a little lens into every one of your personalities and uh, definitely how each one of you contribute to what we saw today, which I thought was fantastic. So I'm going to pass the mic to Doug. Yeah, I, I just want to pick up on that. Um, you know, in a sense, you've all had a very special opportunity. Um, you've all talked about how this was new to you and the way that you practice and study. Um, we're going to have a communication link set up where you're going to be part of it and those of us that steward this will be part of it. My challenge to you is can you go back to your, to your faculty, can you get the attention of the group and actually do a bit of a talk about what you've done and in that talk can you get to this point, can you reach out to them and say, you know, this was remarkable. The, 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 what we learned from working shoulder to shoulder is something that was really special. And, you know, uh, you might make a difference to uh, more than just us. I just wanted to say, I live in a neighborhood and I've lost many golf balls on the golf course. <laughs> and uh, it definitely it's time to repurpose it. And uh, if you want to be convinced, you should really take the subway east of Victoria Park, especially this time of year, between Victoria Park and Warden. Now that the leaves are down, there's a lot of makeshift kind of uh, fire pits and where you know, the community gathers kind of informally, right? So, um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the neighborhood is, especially this neck of the woods, really bursting at the seams with the influx of new refugees and all that. And just wanted to add in, uh, on Charlotte's comments, um, I know you said you wanted to... Uh, Ideally, you would have liked to have uh, somebody from a community engaged in the process. My wife has worked in the NGO sector for years, and she's worked with the NGO um, organizations in the neighborhood. If you need a contact, we can maybe get you in touch. So my name is Alex, by the way. So <laughs> moving things forward. And uh, yeah, just, just wanted to add that's a great job. That's all. Any other questions? No. Uh, if not, I'd like to thank all of the people that have come to um, listen and provide feedback, and, and Eric, who actually uh, participated in, in giving everyone a sense of ecology to begin with. Your comments have been very, very um, inspiring, and I think these folks here have inspired us all, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful week. I, I speak for everyone that... Hmm? Yeah, I, I <laughs> this, is, this is my partner, um, former partner. Um, so, <laughs> he, he just retired. Um, but but uh, I, I, Doug's saying thank him, and, and this, is the, this is the fellow he, he's suggesting that I thank. Um, Michael has done all the heavy lifting throughout the year to get us to a point to launch this. So um, thanks, Mike. It's, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> um, um, in, all ser in all seriousness, though, um, I didn't do all the heavy lifting, and there's a much wider um, team that supported this, and without them, this would have never happened. I think the residents know a few of them, like Heather. Um, Fizza was heavily involved as well as Nicole. Um, and I'm probably forgetting a few people. Chelsea, um, I mean, Michael's been uh, working the sound today, which I didn't even ask him to do, by the way, and that would have crashed and burned uh, for sure without Michael. So 
um, it's definitely a team effort. Thanks. And so with that, we'll close for today. Oh, you were, oh, wait, you want? Last, too? for sure. Yes. Uh, this is on. I think uh, throughout the whole week, uh, each of us were blown away by um, Dialogue's hospitality time and time again, um, as well as um, people in the office that were eager to help us from being able to get out of the building. <laughs> At the end of the day, we can't find the glass door that we're supposed to go to. And, um, or you can't leave the building without a, a card. <laughs> um, so that, that hospitality was mind blowing um, and the generosity of dialogue. Uh, many of us have uh, limited student budgets. <laughs> and so being blown away by um, big piles of fruit and, um, and nice meals as well to just facilitate that we didn't have to stop or worry about anything. We could just plow through um, in our collaboration. And I think that was really key and a comfy place to <laughs> sleep at the end of the night as well. Um, I think, <laughs> not in the office. Not, yeah, yeah, we all slept. By, by, by the way, you did go home last we night, We all right? slept, yes. Okay, because I, I came at around 10 o'clock and you were still here, right. So I'll, I'm, I'm gonna open up to the group if people have like some specifics, but um, we're, we are all very appreciative. Right, and so just building on that hospitality, it's, I've experienced other offices where it's really talk about um, community engagement or even connecting to students as more of like a at base sort of thing, but not an integrated, we want to know what you think, but we really felt that you were involved and that hospitality and passion came through in everyone we've met, um, that you care about your work, that in, in each of your own disciplines, but that you also cared about what we think and we're applying that to how you think as well. So we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you guys, cheers. And, and for, for the guests, before you leave, we've got a little token of our appreciation, so don't escape before we can hand that off to you. And for you folks, we're gonna have lunch um, afterwards for a debrief to find out what you didn't like about this <laughs> and what and what we should do next year because Shane's going to car carry the can for it next year. And I will say that's really important because this year's residency was shaped and formed by the feedback that we got from the students last year. So, so really do um, provide us with that feedback and if you can't get it all out today, um, I think Shane will open up to, to future comments. So every year it gets better and it's partly, partly gets better because of that feedback that you provide. So thank you. Cheers. Okay, we'll bring it to a close. Thanks very much, everyone.